We're going to get started. If you can find your seats. Welcome and thank you for being here for what we promise will be an amazing and enlightening evening with Johan Hari. My name is Mimi Rapley Larson and I am faculty in the social work program. I'm also a part of the Pruitt Center Advisory Board. <coughs> Excuse me. And probably less known, but as cherished a role, the president of the UWS Johan Hari Fan Club. <laughs> so. <laughs> Yes. What? Self-appointed. We will be having meetings <laughs> after this. Um, I'm so excited that he is here to share his works and his travels and his stories about very pressing issues with us this evening. Before um, we begin, I'd like to uh, <coughs> excuse me. I'd like to invite our chancellor to come up and say a few words of greeting. A very warm yellow jacket welcome to our lecture with Johan Hari via the Pruitt Center for Mindfulness and Well-Being and with the support of the Tommy G. Thompson Center for Leadership and Public Policy here in the beautiful Yellow Jacket Union. I especially want to recognize Doug and Becky Pruitt who are generous supporters for whom the center is named and who are with us here tonight. Thank you, Doug and Becky, for your belief in UW Superior, in the power of a what the center could do, and for your friendship and collaboration. And I also want to recognize our own wonderful uh, Randy Barker and Lori Tuminen. who are the talent of the center and make events such as this and other programming accessible to the campus and to the community. And speaking of which, greetings to our community members that are joining us here and those who are online. We are absolutely delighted you could be here with us tonight. At the University of Wisconsin-Superior, we are committed to diverse voices, public dialogue, and serving our community and region. This lecture is just one of the ways we seek to stimulate ideas and discussions around topics and policy implications that are important to us all. These last few years, we've been focusing on the public health crisis surrounding mental health. And I'm sure that each of us has been touched in one way or another, whether that's with a family member, friend, loved one, colleague, or even ourselves. Now, I've read two of Mr. Hari's books, Stolen Focus and Now Lost Connections. I have found them thought-provoking, extremely well-researched, and sometimes downright scary. I was reading an article this morning that talked about loneliness is the new smoking, and another in a mainstream magazine that ketamine, the anesthetic used for humans and animals to induce unconsciousness, that was once a party drug, is now being used and marketed as a therapy to treat depression in wellness spas, womb-like spaces with soothing colors and cushy soft couches. In a world where we are more but less connected to each other, where we run at breakneck speeds in our lives and where we long to feel valued, Johan Hari uses his own experiences combined with global research to provide some insights on what might be possible as, why, as we try to live as better human beings in a complicated world that seems to be working against us and to not lose ourselves. My hope is that after tonight that you will continue the conversation, that this sparks something in you that you bring and continue to talk about in your own worlds long after you've left us. So again, welcome on behalf of the university, and I think you're in for a real treat to enjoy Mr. Hari. This evening's event is again sponsored by the Pruitt Center, and thank you, Doug and Becky, for your support of it. Um, it is also due in, in large part to the hard work that Randy Barker and Lori Tumanen have done. So I'd like to invite them up to tell you a little bit more, more about how this evening was planned. We're all
all anxious to get to Johan. So I will only talk, um, I want to thank the Thompson Center, who's delighted to be able to sponsor today's event and partner with us at the Pruitt Center. Special thank you to the Thompson Center staff, Alex, Ruth, and Mary-Kate, who weren't able to join us in Superior Live tonight, but they are watching on YouTube. Um, for those unfamiliar with the Thompson Center, it was established to follow in the footsteps of former Wisconsin Governor Tommy Thompson, who worked with colleagues on both sides of the aisle to advance the public good. The Thompson Center seeks to carry on Governor Thompson's work by informing and inspiring current and future public leaders, fostering leadership skills, and promoting effective public leadership. Their work, they, work further to, they work to further these goals by offering public events like this one, funding research and scholarships, conducting other activities across all UW campuses. And all their events are free and open to the public. So for more information, please check out their website. Randy? Good evening and welcome everyone. On behalf of the Pruitt Center for Mindfulness and Wellbeing, I just want to welcome everyone here in person. Also welcome to all the people that are joining us on live stream. Um, I just want to take some time and thank everyone here that's uh, here and I want to thank the individuals and groups that really helped with this event. Uh, first and foremost, I want to thank Johan Hari. He's come all the way from London to be here this evening. Wisconsin's appears, so thank you, Johan. I also want to thank Becky and Doug. Um, again, with, without your generosity and support, we wouldn't have a center. So I want to just thank you again. I want to thank our, uh, you know, the team, the Pruitt Center team. Lori, we have two incredible peer educators, Caitlin and Jack, who have also done a lot of work. Yeah. I also want to thank numerous other individuals too. I want to thank Laurel Eaton. She really helped us get the ball rolling. Continuing Education, the Center for Continuing Education that did a tremendous amount of work with the registration process. Our marketing team was absolutely outstanding. As you can see, we have a great crowd here tonight and it was due to a lot of their work. Um, also want to thank um, our IT department that's really helped out. So thank you, Jay, really appreciate it. Um, I want to thank the YU staff. They've done an outstanding job getting all the rooms ready for us today. So I want to thank them. Uh, Chartwells, what a wonderful spread of food out there this evening. So I want to thank them. I want to thank our, our, our sign interpreters, um, Sound Central for recording and live streaming the event. And also want to thank the, the Zenith Bookstore for the book sales tonight. And they will be selling after the event also. Um, if, if you were mentioned, if you could just stand and be recognized for a moment here, and we, if we could give them a round of applause. People that I mentioned, if you could stand up. Thank you. I'm now gonna turn it back over to Mimi to introduce tonight's incredible presenter. Wow, what an honor to be able to introduce Johan Hari. Um, I know that some, most of you, have heard ab about him, maybe in classes, maybe by reading his books, by watching the TED Talks that he has done. Let me tell you a little bit more, more about his impressive credentials. Johan Hari was twice named Journalist of the Year by Amnesty International. He is the author of three New York Times best-selling books, and his most recent work, Stolen Focus, was also named by Amazon's number one nonfiction book of the year. Johan has spent his life writing about society's biggest issues and has contributed to the publications all over the world, including the New York Times, <coughs> excuse me, The Guardian, and Politico. Johan Hari is a man of vision. He tackles some of society's most pressing problems, addiction, depression, anxiety, and loneliness, with a thorough examination of each from different perspectives. He doesn't provide simple solutions, but instead asks us to engage in radically new conversations about what is missing in our lives and that could cause mental health problems and offers us transformative ideas going forward. What 
we have asked Johan to do is to talk for an hour and then leave time for questions afterwards. If you do have questions, we have two microphones on either end of the, uh, the rows, and please come up at when we will open that up to people. So please help me give a warm welcome to our speaker, Johan Hari. Hi, everyone. Oh, I'll just tilt this towards me. I'm, I'm very relieved, actually, that I've got this kind of microphone because years ago when I had to give a TED talk, they made me you know, wear one of those, you know, those head mics where you attach it to your head. And I said to the technician as he put it on my head, you know, if you make me wear this, I'm going to feel like Madonna. And, and he looked at me really intensely and said, you should always feel like Madonna. <laughs> so... So now, whenever I wear one of those, I get this, no matter what I'm talking about, I get this really strong urge to randomly sing Papa Don't Preach, uh, which does not go down well. Um, I'm going to ask a, a favour of everyone, which is, until I turned 40, I thought jet lag was a myth. I am now 44 years old, and I'm like a 100-year-old man when I land somewhere. So to deal with this, I've drunk enough caffeine to kill, like, a whole field of cows. So... If I start to talk too fast, uh, it will torture this lovely person who's doing the sign. Uh, so could you just wave your hand in the air, especially since my weird Downton Abbey accent is hard for people to understand, even when I speak at a normal speed. Um, I'm also very relieved about one other thing, which is that recently when I've been giving speeches, uh, very often they've um, brought, put behind me on a screen my like publicity photo from my book, but that's my photo at my pre-COVID weight, so now I started to feel when I'm giving a speech like it's a kind of Weight Watchers ad where I'm the before and then there's the after <laughs> picture there. So I'm really pleased that has not happened. Uh, I just want to thank, obviously, uh, Randy and Laurie and Doug and Becky and Mimi and everyone who invited me here. I'm really happy to, to be here and be really moved by getting to know you all. Um, I wrote my book, Lost Connections, because there were these two kind of mysteries that were really hanging over me. There were these things that I didn't understand. And if I'm honest, I was quite afraid to look into. The first mystery was, I'm now 44 years old, and every single year that I've been alive, depression and anxiety have increased here in the United States, in Britain, and in fact, across the Western world, right? It just goes up and up and up. And obviously, in the last two years, hugely spiked even more. At the same time, we're having a huge increase in addiction. In fact, last year had the highest number of overdose deaths in the entire history of the American Republic. And I wanted to understand why. Why is this happening to us? Why is it that with each year that passes, more and more of us are finding it so much harder to get through the day? And I wanted to understand this because of a more kind of personal mystery when I was a teenager, I remember going to my doctor and saying that I had this feeling like pain was kind of leaking out of me. I didn't understand it. I was quite ashamed of it. Uh, and my doctor told me a story that I now know wasn't totally wrong, but was really oversimplified. My doctor said, well, we know why this happens. There's a chemical in people's brains called serotonin. Some people are just naturally lacking it. You're clearly one of them. All you need to do is take these drugs, you're going to be fine. So I was given a chemical antidepressant called Paxil, and I felt much better when I started taking it. A few months later, this feeling of pain came back. So I went back to the doctor, I was given a higher dose. Again, I felt better. Again, a few months later, this feeling of pain came back. And I was in a kind of cycle of taking higher and higher doses, until eventually I took the highest dose you could take for 13 years at the end of which I still felt awful. And I was asking myself, well, what's, what's happening here? Because I'm doing everything that you're told to do according to the story that our culture tells us about depression and anxiety. Why do I still feel this way? So to try to, to get to the bottom of these two mysteries, I ended up going on a really big journey all over the world from Moscow to Miami to Melbourne, um, not just to cities that begin with the letter M. I don't know why I keep doing that. Uh, and I interviewed over 200 of the leading experts on depression, on anxiety, on addiction. And I learned there's actually scientific evidence for nine factors that can cause anxiety and depression. And that many of those factors have been hugely rising in recent years. Some of the causes are in our biology, but 
But most of the causes are not in our biology. They're factors in the way we live. And once we understand these factors, it opens up a whole different set of solutions that we can begin to pursue, which of course should be offered alongside the option of drugs for some people. So I think if I start to explain what those causes are, you'll, you'll see what I mean about uh, what's causing this crisis, why it's going up, and the different solutions we should be offering people. So let's start with what I think is the most obvious of the, the causes. We are the loneliest society in human history. There's a study that asks Americans, how many close friends do you have who you could turn to in a crisis? And when they started doing it years ago, the most common answer was five. Today, the most common answer is none. There are more people who have nobody to turn to when things go wrong than any other option. There's a study that recently asked Americans, um, how many people know you well? And 42% of people said that nobody knows them well. And I wanted to understand, well, what it, how did we get here and what is this doing to us? So I spent a lot of time discussing this with an amazing man named Professor John Cassiopo, who's the leading, it was at the time, he subsequently sadly died. He, he was the leading expert in the world on loneliness. He was the first person to prove that loneliness causes depression. Because it used to be thought that it was just that, oh, people become depressed and that makes them lonely, which obviously does happen sometimes. But he showed it also went the other way, that being lonely is a massive cause of depression. And I remember him saying to me, he was trying to, I said, well, why would that be? And he said to me, look, Johan, why are we here? Why do we exist? Everyone in this room, why are we here? One key reason is that our ancestors, where we evolved on the savannas of Africa, were really good at one thing. They weren't bigger a lot of the time than the animals they took down. They weren't faster a lot of the time than the animals they took down. But they were much better at one thing, at banding together into groups and cooperating, right? That was our superpower. That's why we survived. That's why we've become such a successful species, because we knew how to band together and cooperate. And he said to me, if you think about the circumstances where we evolved, where all of our instincts come from, if you were separated from the group, if you were separated from the tribe, you were depressed and anxious for a really good reason. You were in terrible danger. Right? If you got injured, you would die. If an animal attacked you, you would die. Um, loneliness evolved as a signal telling us, get back to the tribe, get back to the group, right? Just like bees evolved to live in a hive, humans evolved to live in a tribe. If you ever see a bee that's been separated from its hive, it goes crazy, right? It can't function. It doesn't exist separate from the hive. We are like that. And we are the first humans ever to disband our tribes. And it is making us feel awful. It is really harming us. So that's one of the causes. Think about the solutions that begins to open up when we understand that core insight. So one of the heroes of my book is a doctor, a family doctor in a poor part of East London named Sam Everington. So I actually lived in the same neighborhood as him for a long time, though sadly he was never my doctor. And Sam had, lo like doctors everywhere in the developed world, Sam had loads of patients coming to him with terrible depression and anxiety. And like me, he is not opposed to chemical antidepressants. They give some relief to some people, which is worth doing. But Sam began to notice some pretty basic things. Firstly, that the people he was giving chemical antidepressants to, um, it was usually taking the edge off their problems, but not solving them, right? It was helping a little bit, but it wasn't dealing with the core of the problem. And secondly, he noticed that his patients were depressed and anxious for really understandable reasons. Like, for example, they were really lonely. So he began to pioneer a different approach, one that's subsequently spread to many parts of the world, and I think is really close to the vision that you guys have here at the Pruitt Center. So one day, a woman who I got to know later called Lisa Cunningham came to see Sam. Lisa had been shut away in her home she was a former nurse. She'd been shut away in her home for seven years with absolutely crippling depression and anxiety. And she'd been on chemical antidepressants for, for all that time. And Sam said to her, 
don't worry, I'll carry on giving you these drugs, but I'm also gonna prescribe something else. I'm gonna prescribe for you to come here to these offices twice a week to meet with a group of other depressed and anxious people, not to talk about how lousy you feel. You can do that if you want, but that's not the point of it. What I want you guys to do is meet up and find something meaningful that you can do together, right? You guys have to figure out what it is. The first time the group met, Lisa literally started vomiting with anxiety. She'd been away from people for so long, it was just so overwhelming. But the group, they rubbed her back, they started talking, they were like, what could we do? These were inner city East London people like me, they knew nothing about gardening. But there was an area behind the doctor's offices that was, uh, well, apologize if anyone doesn't like swearing, it was called Dog Shit Alley, because it was a place where dogs would go and shit, right? It was just kind of scrub land. And they said, you know, we could turn Dog Shit Alley into a garden, right? Like, oh, okay, that's something we could do. So they went to the library and took out books about gardening. They started watching clips on YouTube about how you garden. They started to get their fingers in the soil. They started to learn the rhythms of the seasons. There's a lot of evidence that exposure to the natural world is an incredibly powerful antidepressant. But they started to do something even more important. They started to form a tribe. They started to form a group. They started to care about each other. If someone didn't show up, they'd all go around looking for them, go, hey, are you okay? Do you need any help? The way Lisa put it to me, as the garden began to bloom, we began to bloom. And um, there have been studies now, this approach is called social prescribing. It's where you prescribe for people to take part in groups. This has now been studied all over Europe. One study, for example, found that it was more than twice as effective as chemical antidepressants. I think for kind of obvious reason, right? It was dealing with some of the reasons why people were so depressed and anxious in the first place. Um, let's think about another one of the causes. So everyone knows that junk food has taken over our diets and made us physically sick, right? I don't say this with any sense of superiority. In fact, um, as you can tell from my chins, I'm sure, um, I, uh, on Christmas Eve 2009, I went to my local branch of KFC at lunchtime. And I, I went to the guy behind the counter and I said my normal order, which is so disgusting, I won't even repeat it. And the guy behind the counter said, oh, Johan, I'm really glad you're here. I was like, okay. He said, wait there, wait there. And he went off behind where they like fry the chicken and everything. And he came back with every member of staff and a, a massive Christmas card in which they had written to our best customer. <laughs> and everyone had signed it. And one of the reasons my heart sank is I thought, this isn't even the fried chicken shop I come to the most. How, <laughs> how can this be happening? But uh, so I say this with no sense of superiority when it comes to junk food, but we all know that the move to junk food has harmed us, has caused all sorts of health problems. But a really interesting thing has also happened with our minds. Just like junk food has taken over our diets and made us physically sick, a kind of junk values have taken over our minds and made us mentally sick. For thousands of years, philosophers have said, if you think life is about money and status and showing off, you're gonna feel like shit, right? That's not an exact quote from Confucius, but that is basically what he said, right? <laughs> but weirdly, nobody had scientifically investigated this until an extraordinary man I got to know named Professor Tim Kasser, who studied how what you think is important in life affects all sorts of outcomes. And what he discovered is, the more you begin to think life is about money and showing off, the kind of values that are in inculcated in us by advertising, Instagram, everything like them, the more likely you are to become depressed and anxious by a really quite significant amount. As you think life is about these external superficial things, you become much more likely to become depressed and anxious. And it's partly because it makes your relationships more insecure. It's partly because it just trains you to look for happiness in all the wrong places. We all know that none of us are gonna lie on our deathbeds and think about all the shoes we bought and all the likes we got on TikTok, right? You're not gonna think about that. You're gonna think about moments of love and meaning and connection in your life. But as Professor Kasser put it to me, 
We live in a machine which is designed to get us to neglect what is important about life and to seek meaning and happiness in places where we will not get them. And interestingly, Professor Kasser pioneered an approach which I really recommend people do. I think it's, again, very much in line with the philosophy of your centre that is a, began to reverse this. They did a really interesting experiment. So they were contacted by a school in Minneapolis, not far away, um, a kind of middle-class school that was having a big problem. So the kids at this school were getting obsessed with getting the latest Nike sneakers, the latest iPhone, and they, the kids were really freaking out if they didn't get them. And it was causing a lot of problems for the parents because the parents often couldn't afford this tech. They were really freaked out by it. So the school said they hired a, a wonderful um, financial advisor called Doug. They said, will you come in and just give these kids advice on budgeting and make them figure out, understand why their parents can't afford this stuff, right? So Doug came in, he starts talking to the kids and quickly realizes these kids do not care about budgeting, right? They're just like, we don't care, we need the iPhone. We don't care, we need the sneakers. And he'd read about Professor Kasser's work. So he contacted Professor Kasser and said, yeah, I think something's going wrong with the values for these kids. What can we do about this? And this is where the experiment began. So all the kids in this school were invited with their parents to come. I think it was uh, once a fortnight, once every two weeks. But I think it was six months. And the first meeting they had, the parents and the kids came in. They would sit in groups. Um, and the first time, the guy who led the group just said, what I want you to do is make a list of everything you've got to have. And they didn't define what that meant. They just said, that means whatever you think it means. And of course, at first, everyone said, well, you've got to have food and water. But quite quickly, people started listing things you have not got to have, like Nike sneakers, the latest iPhone. And often the parents would include things that you haven't got to have, right? And they'd say to them, they, when they went down the list, they'd say, okay, let's imagine that tomorrow you get these Nike sneakers. How will your life be different? And what's interesting is no one said, oh, I'm a basketball player and the Nike sneakers will mean I can jump higher. No one said that, right? They said things like, well, then people will envy me. People will want me to be part of their group, right? It doesn't take long to get people to say that out loud, to go, oh, so actually what you want is to be part of a group, right? What made you think that you needed to buy a little a piece of plastic with a blue tick on it to get that? Could we try getting that without it? So initially it was about taking apart these junk values, but the next stage was even more important. They said to people, think about a moment in your life where you have felt meaning and connection. Right, I just urge everyone here to think about that. And they got them to write it down and talk about that moment. And they talked among themselves. And they said to them, and people named different things. Some people it was, you know, uh, running on the beach with their kids. Some people it was um, writing. Some people it was playing the guitar, whatever it was. And they said, okay, how could we build more of your life around pursuing these moments of meaning and connection and less around buying useless crap you don't need, right? And then every couple of weeks they'd check in and they just reported back on how they were doing. And what was incredible was just having these conversations, we do not have these cultures, conversations in our culture, just having these conversations led to a really significant shift in people's values over those six months, which we know leads to a significant fall in depression and anxiety. So again, when you reframe the problem, you begin to find deeper and more meaningful solutions. I wanna give you another example of that. A person who made a breakthrough in understanding something about depression. But to understand it, I think you need to understand the person who did it. And for about two minutes, you're going to think, why the hell is he telling us this story? This has nothing to do with depression. Bear with me, because it led to this incredible breakthrough. In 1981, in San Diego, a doctor named Vincent Felitti was approached with a problem. So he was approached by Kaiser Permanente, who are one of the big not-for-profit medical providers in California. In fact, the biggest at the time. And they said, look, we've got a problem, and we don't know what to do about it. And the problem they had was obesity. Actually, it was incredibly low compared to now. But at the time, they were like, obesity's going up and up. It's harming people's health. It's really harming our bottom line. Um, nothing we do works. We give people nutritional advice. We give them diets. Nothing's working. Could you just help us to do Blue Skies research, figure out what the hell would solve this problem? So he said, okay, he took quite a lot of money, and he's like, oh, what do I do? So he started to work with 200 severely obese people, people who weighed more than 400 pounds. 
And at first he's like, what? I don't know what to do with them. And then one day he had an idea that seems, and in fact is, quite stupid. He said, what would happen if really obese people literally stopped eating and we gave them like vitamin shots so they didn't get scurvy? Would they just burn through the fat supplies in their body and lose weight? So obviously with a ton of medical supervision, he starts doing this. And incredibly, at first, it worked. There's a woman who I'm going to call Susan, that's not her real name, who went from being more than 400 pounds to 138 pounds. It was extraordinary. These transformations were happening throughout the program. Susan was telling Dr. Felidi that he saved her, her life. Her family were ringing him up saying, my God, you've saved Susan's life. This is in incredible. And then one day, something happened that no one expected. Susan cracked. She went to KFC. I should think it was KFC. That's me projecting somewhere, some fast food place. <laughs> she went to some fast food place, started obsessively eating again, and quite quickly was back at a dangerous weight. Not where she'd been, but at a dangerous weight. And Dr. Felitti called Susan in. He said, Susan, what happened? She looked down. She was obviously really ashamed. She said, I don't, I don't know what happened. I don't know. He said, well, tell me about the day you cracked. Did anything happen that day that hadn't happened any other day? Turned out something happened that day that had never happened to Susan. She was in a bar and a man hit on her. Not in a nasty way, in a really nice way. And she felt completely freaked out and she went and started eating. That's when Dr. Felitti asked Susan something it had never occurred to him to ask his patients before. He said to her, Susan, when did you begin to put on weight? In her case, it was when she was 14. He said, well, Susan, did anything happen when you were 14 that didn't happen when you were 12, 15? Anything in particular happened that year? And she looked down and she said, well, that's when my grandfather started raping me. Dr. Felitti interviewed everyone in the program. He discovered that 60% of them had made their extreme weight gain in the aftermath of being sexually abused or assaulted. And at first he's like, well, how can that be? What does this mean? Susan explained it to him really well. She said, overweight is overlooked, and that's what I need to be. He realized this thing that seems so irrational was performing a profoundly important function for many of the people in the program. It was protecting them from sexual attention. He said he realized it's like we've been, it's like we've been looking at a house fire and we've been focusing on the smoke and not on the fire. But you know, this is a small study, it's 200 people, hard to draw these big conclusions, it seems so strange. So Dr. Felitti went to the Center for Disease Control, the CDC, to get a load of money to do a much bigger study, which is where we got the breakthrough with depression and anxiety and addiction indeed. So what happened is he got money so that every single person in the city of San Diego who came for healthcare to Kaiser Permanente for a whole year doesn't matter what for, broken leg, schizophrenia, anything, was given a questionnaire, <clears throat> and it had two parts. The first part said, did any of these bad things happen to you when you were a child? There were 10 of them. Things like sexual abuse, physical abuse, neglect, severe cruelty, that kind of thing. And the second part was originally just going to say, just ask about your weight. But luckily for us, at the last minute, they added a load of other stuff. Do you have an addiction problem? Have you ever attempted suicide? Are you depressed? That kind of thing. And they did this study for a year, and when they added up the figures, at first they were like, no, we've made a mistake. Go back, do the whole thing again. They added it up, and the figures were right. For every category of childhood trauma you experienced, you were two to four times more likely to be depressed, anxious, or addicted. But when you got into the multiple categories, the figures just blew up. If you had had six categories of childhood trauma, you were 3,100% more likely to have attempted suicide and 4,600% more likely to have an injecting drug problem. I mean, you very rarely get figures like that in, in any form of science, right? In medical science. Um, I spent a lot of time with Dr. Felitti in San Diego, and he is a lovely old man who made this brilliant breakthrough. And the first time I interviewed him, he was explaining all this to me. I was so angry actually ended the interview early. And I went to the beach, I was like, why am I so angry with this like, lovely old man who's done these good things? 
And I realized, you know, I had experienced, we had a lot of addiction in my family. I'd experienced some very extreme acts from an adult in my life when I was a child. And I realized I didn't want to think about that. I didn't want to think about that playing out in my life now. I didn't want to give this individual power over me now. But the reason I'm glad I went back and carried on interviewing him is because of what Dr. Felitti discovered next. So they'd done this study, and suddenly they had all these thousands of people who had indicated that they'd experienced some form of childhood abuse. So their doctors were told, don't call them in, but next time they come in, say to them something like, I see that when you were a child you were sexually abused, or whatever the nature of the abuse was. I'm really sorry that happened to you. That should never have happened. Would you like to talk about it? And 40% of people did not want to talk about it, but 60% did, and they wanted to talk about it on average for five minutes. And then it was randomly assigned. Some of them were told, you can go to see a therapist to talk about it more. What's incredible is just those five minutes of an authority figure saying, this should never have happened to you. I'm so sorry. That alone led to a really significant fall in depression and anxiety. And the people who were referred for extra help got a bigger fall. And this fits with a much wider body of evidence. It's not the shame that destroys you. Sorry, it's not the trauma that destroys you. It's the shame about the trauma. And giving people places to release that shame, which they, of course, should never have had to hold, is in itself an antidepressant. Because I would argue what we need to do is redefine what we think of as an antidepressant. Anything that reduces depression and anxiety is an antidepressant. And there was someone who really helped me to think about this. Um, I went to interview a South African psychiatrist called Dr. Derek Summerfield. Um, and he, said to, he told me something that happened to him once. So he was in Cambodia, in Southeast Asia, in 2001, when they first introduced chemical antidepressants for people in Cambodia. They'd never had them before. And the local doctors, the Cambodian, he wasn't there to, to work on that, he just happened to be there. And the local doctors, the Cambodians, were like, well, what are antidepressants? And he explained to them. And they said to him, oh, we don't need them, we've already got antidepressants. And he was like, what do you mean? He thought they were going to talk about some kind of herbal remedy like, I don't know, St. John's wort or something. Instead, they told him a story. There was a farmer in their community who worked in the rice fields. And one day he stood on a landmine and got his leg blown off. So they took him to hospital, they gave him an artificial limb, they gave him all sorts of physical therapy. And several months later, he went back to work in the same rice fields. But apparently it's extremely painful to work underwater when you've got an artificial limb. And I'm guessing it was pretty traumatic to go back and work in the field where he got blown up. The man started to cry a lot. After a while, he just refused to get out of bed. He felt so sad. He developed what we would call classic depression. This is when the Cambodian doctors said to Dr. Summerfield, oh, well, that's when we gave him an antidepressant. And he said, what was it? They explained that they went and sat with him. They listened to him. They realized that his pain made sense. You only had to listen to him for five minutes to see why he felt so bad. One of the doctors figured, if we bought this guy a cow, he could become a dairy farmer, wouldn't have to work in the fields, wouldn't be in this position that was screwing him up so much. So they bought him a cow. Within a couple of weeks, his crying stopped. Within a month, his depression was gone. It never came back. They said to Dr. Summerfield, so you see, doctor, that cow, that was an antidepressant, right? Now, you've been raised to think about depression the way we have. That sounds like a joke. I, I went to my doctor for an antidepressant. She gave me a cow. But what those Cambodian doctors knew intuitively is what the leading medical body in the whole world, the World Health Organization, has been trying to tell us for years. If you're depressed, if you're anxious, you're not weak, you're not crazy, you're not in the main a machine with broken parts. You're a human being with unmet needs. Everyone here knows that you have natural physical needs. You need food, you need water, you need shelter, you need clean air. If I took those things away from you, you'd be in real trouble real fast. But there's equally strong evidence that every human being has natural psychological needs. You need to feel you belong. You need to feel your life has meaning and purpose. 
You need to feel that people see you and value you. You need to feel you've got a future that makes sense. And our culture is good at many things. I'm glad to be alive today. But we have been getting less and less good at meeting these deep underlying psychological needs for a long time. And then what happened to us in the last two years? Our ability to get our psychological needs met absolutely collapsed. They went through the floor. And entirely predictably, depression, anxiety, and addiction massively soared, massively. Look at what happened to the suicide rate, for example, and the overdose rate. Um, You can see how this different way of thinking about depression Now, there are biological contributions to depression. That's absolutely true. But they are part of a bigger picture. And my worry is, because we only talk about the biology, this is not the intention of the people who do it at all. But if you're saying to people, your biology, the sole reason for your depression and anxiety is a biological problem, what you're effectively saying to people is, your your pain doesn't mean anything. It's like a glitch in a computer program. But what we need to explain to people is your pain makes sense. Your pain is a signal. It's there for a reason. We need to listen to it and honor it. We need to stop insulting this signal and start listening to it because it is telling us something we really need to hear. And I think this also relates to how we think about um, addiction. Um, So like I mentioned, we had a lot of addiction in my family. One of my earliest memories is of trying to wake up one of my relatives and not being able to. And I was, I was too small then to understand why. But as I got older, I realized we had, um, had drug addiction in my family, several members of my family. And um, I think like a lot of people in that position, I know there's lots of people in that position here tonight. I was a real mixture of feelings, right? Part of me felt very compassionate for the people I loved who had addiction problems. I could see how much they were in pain. Part of me was really angry and was like, why don't you just stop? What's wrong with you? It was this real mixture. And um, I really felt like nothing I was doing was helping. So it's one of the reasons I spent a lot of time investigating what might actually help with this. And so I got to know lots of people all over the world. And I learned lots of things about addiction. But one of the things that most shocked me is I learned that I had actually misunderstood the addiction I had seen playing out in front of me all my life. So if you had asked me when I started researching this, let's talk about heroin addiction because that was close to me. If you'd said to me, Johan, what causes heroin addiction? I would have looked at you like you were an idiot and I would have said, well, (laughs) the clue's in the name. Obviously, heroin causes heroin addiction, right? We've been told this story for 100 years that's totally part of our common sense. We Certainly, it was part of mine. We think if we kidnapped the next 20 people who walked past this campus and we injected them all with heroin three times a day for a month, like a, like a villain in a horror movie, at the end of that month, they'd all be heroin addicts for a very obvious and simple reason. There's chemical hooks in heroin that their bodies would start to desperately physically crave. You're exposed to the hook in the drug, You want more and more of it. At the end of it, you have this tremendous physical hunger. It's why another word for being addicted is being hooked, right? It turns out that story's not totally wrong. Chemical hooks are real, but they are a very small part of addiction. And the first thing that alerted me to the fact there's something wrong with this story that we've been telling is when it was explained to me, in Britain, if you step out into the street and you get hit by a truck and you break your hip, you'll be taken to hospital and you'll be given a lot of diamorphine. Diamorphine is heroin, right? You'll be given it for the pain. It's it's really good heroin. It's the medically pure stuff, right? It's not the stuff like the stuff you buy on the streets. It's much, much more potent. If any of you have a British grandmother who's had a hip replacement operation, your grandmother's taken a lot of heroin, right? (laughs) And if what we think is right, that addiction is caused primarily or entirely by exposure to the chemical hooks in the drug, What should be happening to all these grandmas in Britain? They should be leaving hospital and trying to score on the streets, right? They should be leaving addicted. This has been studied very carefully. It never happens. And I remember when I learned that, just thinking partly in relation to what we think about the opioid crisis here, ask me about that, but thinking, well, that can't, how could that be true? That can't be right. How could you have a situation where you've got someone in a hospital bed who's given really pure heroin for quite a long period of time, they don't become addicted, 
and you've got someone in the alleyway outside shooting up, actually using a weaker form of the drug, and they do become addicted. It doesn't make any sense. And I only began to understand it when I went to Vancouver and interviewed an extraordinary man named Professor Bruce Alexander, who did an experiment that has transformed how we think about addiction all over the world. So Professor Alexander explained to me um, how he, he made a kind of breakthrough on this. He did a series of experiments in 1972. Um, so the way it worked is, um, he, he was kind of uncomfortable with this narrative we have. Thinking, is there something wrong with this? It's like, where does this come from? Where's this story about the chemical hooks come from? It turns out it comes from a series of experiments that were done way before, like in the 1920s. They're really simple experiments. You guys can try them at home if you're feeling a little bit sadistic. You take a rat, you put it in a cage, and you give it two water bottles. One is just water, and the other is water laced with either heroin or cocaine. You probably shouldn't do this at home. Um, <laughs> you put the rat there, it tries both the bottles, and it, it much prefers the drugged water, and it'll keep going back to the drugged water a lot, and eventually, within, usually within a week or two, it will kill itself by overdosing. Some of you will remember there was a famous advertisement in the 1980s from Partnership for a Drug-Free America that showed this and said, it will happen to you. You know, you remember this. Um, but Professor Alexander looked at this experiment and said, well, hang on a minute. You put the rat alone in an empty cage where it's got nothing that makes life worth living for rats. All it's got is the drug water. What would happen if we did this differently? So he built a cage that he called Rat Park, which is basically heaven for rats. Right? They've got loads of friends, they've got loads of cheese, they've got loads of colored balls, they can have loads of sex. Anything a rat likes in life is there in Rat Park. And they've got both the water bottles, the normal water, and the drug water, and of course they try both. They don't know what's in them. This is the fascinating thing. In Rat Park, they don't like the drug water. They hardly ever use it. None of them use it compulsively. None of them overdose. So they go from almost 100% compulsive use and overdose when they do not have the things that make life worth living to no compul sorry, almost 100% compulsive use when they don't have the things that make life worth living, to no compulsive use and overdose when they do have the things that make life worth living. There's lots of human examples. I'm going to come to one in a second. But it made me realize the opposite of addiction is not sobriety, valuable though that is to many people. The opposite of addiction is connection. The core of addiction is about not wanting to be present in your life because your life is too painful a place to be. This, again, is why addiction rose so much under COVID. Suddenly, all our lives were like the rats in the isolated cages, right? Hardly surprising that addiction hugely increased. The, 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 the heart of addiction is not wanting to be present. When you know that, you can see why what we do in the United States, in Britain, is such a disaster. We respond to addiction with the war on drugs, which is based on the theory that people who've got an addiction problem, we need to impose suffering on them to give them an incentive to stop. But once you understand that suffering is the cause of addiction, suffering is the fuel of addiction, suddenly you can see, sometimes we say, oh, the war on drugs doesn't work when it comes to addiction. The truth is much worse. The war on drugs makes addiction worse, right? It takes people who are addicted because they're suffering and imposes more suffering and more pain on them. It makes it harder for them to reconnect with the society. And one of the ways we know this is such a disaster is because there's a place that responded to its addiction crisis. Addiction crisis is actually even worse than the one that's happening here in the United States at the moment by turning to the lessons from Rat Park. So in the year 2000, Portugal had one of the worst drug problems in the world. 1% of the population was addicted to heroin, which is staggering. And every year, um, you know, they tried the American approach more, more shame, more punishment, more imprisonment. And every year the problem got worse. Until finally the Prime Minister and the leader of the opposition, the equivalent of the President and the Speaker of the House, got together and said, look, we can't go on like this with more and more people being addicted to heroin. What are we going to do? So they decided to do something really radical, something nobody had done in like 70 years. They said, should we like ask some scientists what we should do? Um, <laughs> So they set up a panel of scientists and doctors led by an amazing man I got to know named Dr. Joao Goulao. 
And they said to them, you guys go away, figure out what would genuinely solve this problem, and we've agreed in advance we'll do whatever you recommend. So the panel went away for two years. They went all over the world. They looked at Rat Park and many other places. And they came back and they said, okay, everyone, here's what we're going to do. We're going to decriminalize all drugs from cannabis to crack, everything. But, and this is the crucial next step, we're going to take all the money we currently spend on screwing people up, shaming them, arresting them, trying them, imprisoning them. And we're going to spend all that money instead on turning their lives around. And interestingly, it's not really what we think of as drug treatment in the United States. They do some residential rehab that has value. But the biggest thing they did was a big program of social reconnection for people with addiction problems. Say you used to be a mechanic. They'll go to a garage and they'll say, if you employ this guy for a year, we'll pay half his wages. They set up a program of microloans for people with addiction problems so they could set up and run businesses about things they cared about. The goal was to say to every single person in Portugal with an addiction problem, we love you, we value you, we're on your side, we want you back. And by the time I went to Portugal, it was 13 years since this had begun, it's now 20 years, and the results are in. Addiction is down by more than 50%. Overdoses, overdose deaths are down by more than 80%. HIV is down by 90%. And one of the ways you know it works so well is Portugal has a very competitive political system, five political parties. None of them want to go back. I went and interviewed a guy called Joao Figueira, who was the top drug cop in Portugal at the time of the decriminalization. And at the time, he said what lots of people totally understandably said when you hear the idea of decriminalizing all drugs. He said, this is madness. We'll have an explosion in children using drugs. We'll have an explosion in addiction. We cannot do this. And he said to me, everything I said would happen didn't happen. And everything the other side said would happen did. And he said he felt really ashamed that he spent so many years making people's lives worse when he could have been helping them make their lives better. Um, and this is something I saw all over the world. Programs of reconnection reduce depression, anxiety, and addiction enormously. They're not magic bullets. There's still problems everywhere it's been tried. But they hugely reduce the problems. Now, I just want to end by talking about a different group of people. Um, so I think, as you can tell, I learned a huge amount from scientists and doctors all over the world. But I think the group of people who taught me most are a group of people who are not scientists and doctors at all, a group of people I think about every day. So I just want to tell you their story. Um, in the summer of 2011, on a big anonymous housing project in Berlin in Germany, a Turkish-German woman called Nuria Cengiz climbed out of her wheelchair and put a sign in her window. Nuria lived on the ground floor of an, apart the ground floor of an apartment block. This was a big anonymous housing project um, in a poor neighborhood that only three groups of people had ever really lived in. There were recent immigrants like this woman, Nuria, recent Muslim immigrants. There were gay men and there were punk squatters. And as you can imagine, these three groups didn't get along, but no one really knew anyone. And Nuria's sign was very simple. He said, I got a notice from the landlord saying I'm going to be evicted next Thursday. So on Wednesday night, I'm going to kill myself. People walked past Nuria's window. Everyone's rent was going up and up and up. And everyone was worried about being evicted. And everyone knew someone had been evicted. But no one knew Nuria. But people were really struck by this sign. So they knocked on her door. They said, do you need any help? She said, screw you. I don't want any help. I'm going to kill myself. And she slammed the door in their face. But people started talking outside her door. They were like, what can we do to help this woman? And one of them had an idea. There's a big kind of thoroughfare that goes through this. This housing project is called Cotty. And there's a big thoroughfare that goes through Cotty into the center of Berlin, into Mitte. So they were like, you know, on Saturday, if we block the road and we have a protest, the media will probably show up. They'll probably let this woman stay in her apartment. There might even be some pressure for all of us to have our rents, you know, not rise so much. So Saturday came, and they built a little barricade in the middle of the road, and Nuria was like, 
I'm going to kill myself. I might as well let them push me into the middle of the street. So she gets wheeled out. She sits in front of the barricade. And the media show up. And they do these interviews with everyone. And Nuria does these slightly kind of amused interviews. And it gets to the end of the day. And the police come. And they say, OK, everyone, you've had your fun. Take this barricade down. Go home. But the people who lived in Cotty said, well, hang on. You haven't told Nuria she gets to stay. Actually, we want a rent freeze for our entire housing project. Uh, we're not going until you do that. But of course they knew the moment they walked away from this little barricade they built, you know, the police would just tear it down. That would be the end of it. So one of my favorite people at Cotty, a woman called Tanya Gartner, she's one of the punk squatters. She wears these tiny little mini skirts, even in Berlin winters. She's hardcore. Um, Tanya had an idea. In her apartment, she had a klaxon, you know, those horrible things that make a loud noise at soccer matches. So she went and got it. She said, brought it down. She said, OK, everyone, here's what we're going to do. We're going to drop a timetable to man this barricade 24 hours a day until we get what we want. Um, there's going to always be at least two people on the barricade. And if the police come to tear it down, let off the klaxon, and we'll all come down and stop them. So people started signing up to man this barricade. People who had never met and would never have met. And there were these weird, unlikely pairings. So Tanya, in her tiny little mini skirt, was paired with Nuria, who's a very religious Muslim in a full hijab, right? And if I remember right, uh, Tanya and Nuria got the Thursday night shift. And the first night they sit there, they're like, this is awful. We've got nothing in common. This is so awkward. Who could be more different than us? But as the nights went on, they started talking. Tanya and Nuria discovered they had something incredibly powerful in common. Um, Nuria had come to Berlin when she was 16 from her village in Turkey. And she just had two twins. And she was sent to Turkey with her babies to earn enough money to send back to her husband in Istanbul so he could come and join her. So she worked every job she could. And after a year and a half, she, when she almost had the money, she got word from home that her husband had died. She'd always told people in Germany that her husband had died of a heart attack. But actually, in the, sitting there in the cold in Kotti with Tanya, she told her something she'd never told anyone in Germany before. Actually, her husband had died of, a, of tuberculosis, which was seen as like a shameful disease of immigrants. That's when Tanya told Nuria something she never really talked about. She had come to Kotti when she was even younger, when she was 15. She, got th she came from a middle-class family, and her family hated that she was so into punk. So they threw her out. She came to live in a squat in Kotti, and a few months later, she got pregnant. Tanya and Nuria realized that they had both been children with children of their own in this place they didn't understand. They realized they were incredibly similar and became great friends. These pairings were happening all over, all over Kotti, there was a, a, a young Turkish-German lad who was 15 called Mehmet, who kept being nearly thrown out of school. They said he had ADHD. And he got paired with a very grumpy old white German guy called Dieter, uh, who started helping him with his homework. Mehmet started to do much better at school. Um, directly opposite this housing project, Kotti, um, about six months before the protest began, a gay club had opened up called Zudblock. It's run by a, a man I love called Rick Hardstein, who... You know, it's a pretty hardcore gay club. To give you a sense of what it's like, the previous place that Rickard owned was called Cafe Anal. Um, I always think you would want to have a sandwich from Cafe Anal. But the, um, the, uh, and, and when this club had opened, you know, there's a lot of very religious Muslims who live in Kotti, and they were really pissed off. And people smashed the windows. They were really annoyed. But after the protests had been going on for a few months, the people who worked at Zudblog gave all their furniture to the barricade and they said, you know, you guys should come and have your meetings about what to do next in our club. We'll give you free food. We'll give you free drink. And even the kind of social justice people at Cotti were like, look, we're not going to persuade these very religious Muslims to come and have meetings in a gay club underneath posters for things so obscene. I'm not going to mention them here, right? Um, but it did start to happen. As one of the Turkish-German women there, Neriman, said to me, we all realized we had to take these small steps to understand each other. After the protest had been going on for nine months, a lot of the people who live in Kotti are construction workers. And by this time, the barricade they built was like a, a whole construct with like a roof. It's really nice. It's like a house. Um, a guy turned up one day called Tunkai. And Tunkai was in his early 50s. 
Uh, and it's clear when you meet him that he's got some kind of cognitive difficulties. And he'd been living on the streets. Uh, but he's got a lovely energy. He loves hugging people. He's very warm. And he just showed up one day and started helping out. And when the people there realised he was homeless after a week with him hanging out, they were like, we don't want you to be homeless. You should come and live in this thing we've built. It's quite nice. We'll have that as a room. So Tunkai moved in, and he became a much-loved part of the Cotty protest, right? And everyone loved him. Um, and a few, uh, I think it was about nine months after that, the police, turned, the police would come and inspect every now and then. And one day the police came, and Tunkai doesn't like it when people argue. And he, he thought the police were arguing. So he went to try to hug one of the police officers. But the police thought they were being attacked, so they arrested Tunkai. That was when it was discovered Tunkai had been shut away in a psychiatric hospital for 20 years where no one came to see him. In fact, he was often shut away in a padded cell. He'd escaped one day. He was on the streets for a few months and found his way to Cotty. So at that point, the police took him back to the psychiatric hospital right at the other side of Berlin in Charlottenburg, and he was shut away again. At which point, the entire Cotty protest turned into a free Tunkai movement. They descended on this psychiatric hospital at the other side of Berlin. And I remember these psychiatrists being like, what is this? They've got this person they've had shut away for 20 years who no one cared about, and suddenly they've got these very camp gay men, these women in hijabs, and these punks demanding his release. But I remember one of the women, Uli Hartman, said to them, but the thing is, you don't love him. He doesn't belong with you. We love him. He belongs with us. And one of the doctors said, oh, so you're saying you want to look after him? And she said, no, you don't understand. He looks after us. He's part of us. Um, many things, I remember thinking that day, how many of us, if someone carried us away to a psychiatric hospital, would have dozens and dozens of people demanding our immediate release? Not many. Um, many things happened at Cotty. They got Tunkai back. He lives there still. Um, they got a rent freeze for their entire housing project. They then launched a referendum initiative to keep rents down for the whole of Berlin. They got the largest number of written signatures in the history of Germany. There's now a rent freeze for the whole of Berlin. But the last time I saw Nuria, the woman who started all this, she said to me, look, I'm really glad I got to stay in my neighborhood. That's great. I gained so much more than that. I was surrounded by these incredible people all along and I would never have known. And you know, I think you can tell I love these people in Cotty, but they are not unusual, right? The only thing that is unusual about them is that they listened to each other's distress instead of tuning it out. I remember one of the women I mentioned, Neriman, who's one of the Turkish German women, she said to me one day, you know, when I grew up in Turkey, I called my whole village home. And then I came to live in the Western world and I learned that here, what you're meant to call home is just your four walls and if you're lucky, your family. And then she said, this protest began and I started to call all these people and this whole place my home. And she said, she realized in some sense, in this culture, we are homeless. You need to feel you belong. Our sense of home isn't big enough for that. And um, the Bosnian writer Alexander Heyman said, home is where people notice when you're not there. By that standard, a lot of us are homeless or have a very small sense of home. And I think about the people in Cotty. Think about how unhappy they were. Neriman was about, sorry, um, Nuria was about to kill herself. Um, uh, uh, Mehmet was about to be thrown out of school. Loads of them were depressed and anxious. Tunkai was shut away in a padded cell. They did not in the main need to be drugged. They needed to be together. They needed to be seen, to see each other, to hear each other, to have a sense of meaning and purpose together. You know, um, Tanya, the punk squatter, one day we were sitting outside Zublock, the, the gay club, and she said to me, when you're all alone and you feel like shit, you think there's something wrong with you. But what we did is we came out of our corner crying and we started to fight. And we realized we were surrounded by people who felt the same way. And to me, of all the things I learned about depression and anxiety and addiction, that is the most important. We've been sitting in our corner crying, and, it, and the problem just got worse. 
we need to come out of our corner crying and start to fight against the causes of depression and anxiety and addiction. And the evidence is that when we do, we can really begin to reduce these problems and get back to a life of meaning and connection. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think um, we've got microphones if uh, anyone wants to ask a question. Okay. I've always had a secret desire to um, go into an audience with a microphone like Oprah and like ask people things, but, um, <laughs> but I won't do that. <laughs> no, I can't. I'm too British to do that. I can't do it. But the, uh, although, weirdly, Oprah read my book and now occasionally texts me. And every time this happens, I'm just like, no, I'm here with her, like, shut up, everyone. Oprah needs me. <laughs> like, so, be quiet. Um, so anyone want to ask uh, anything? Don't be shy. Ah, oh, here's a person. Thank you. What? Fan club. Hi. <laughs> the fan club, I guess, is over here. <laughs> um, Hi, Johan. First of all, thank you so much for everything that you just shared. My name's T. Leeper, and I work on campus, actually, and with some of these wonderful individuals. Um, I'm curious, from your perspective, how do we do this in today's society, especially when we're so divided on so many different topics? And truthfully, one of the things that I find challenging myself is and I'll just name it right in front of this audience, I guess. Like, I'm a queer person, and sometimes that just in and of itself is a thing that I find people get turned off by, right? Or like other folks get turned off by. And it's difficult, I think, sometimes for us to connect across difference when we're trying to all live our lives authentically and be ourselves, but then there's also those challenges that people might not agree with us or people might not agree with the way that other folks are living their life. Um, and there's just a lot of divide, I think, right? So I'm, I'm, I know it's a big question. <laughs> it's, and I'm not expecting you to solve the world's problems, but just from your perspective, your research, how would you suggest we have these conversations, these communities, and these connections across difference? It's a really important question. Thank you. I think it, one of the things it starts with is realizing that many of these divisions, not all of them, there are things that we sincerely disagree about, right? And we can respect that. I can tell you a story about um, um, someone I got to know in relation to this book about that. But, the, um, but many of these divisions are being artificially amplified, and, and I think we need to understand how and why. So actually, something I learned a lot from my more recent book, Stolen Focus, which is about our attention crisis. But um, I spent a lot of time in Silicon Valley interviewing people who designed key aspects of the world in which we now live. And one of the things that most struck me was how ashamed and guilty they feel about what they've done to us. For example, my friend Dr. James Williams, who was at the heart of Google, designing key aspects of the world in which we live, one day he was speaking at a tech conference. The audience were literally the people who designed the stuff your kids use today. And he said to them, if there's anyone here who wants to live in the world that we're designing, please put up your hand. And nobody put up their hand. Right? Not long afterwards, he quit. Um, and I think it's worth understanding one of the reasons why, which I think goes to the heart of what you're asking about. It's not the only thing, but one of them. Um, so if any of you, if you open, if you took out, please don't, but if you took out your phones and opened TikTok, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram now, those companies begin to make money out of you immediately in two ways. The first way is really obvious. You see advertising. Okay, everyone knows how that works. The second way is much more important. Everything you ever do on these apps is scanned and sorted by their artificial intelligence algorithms to learn who you are and what you like. So let's say that you have ever on these apps said that you like, I don't know, uh, Donald Trump, Bette Midler, and you told your mom you just bought some diapers. Okay, it's gonna figure out if you like President Trump, you're probably conservative. If you like Bette Midler and you're a man, you're probably gay. No disrespect to any straight people who like Bette Midler, I don't believe you. Um, <laughs> And, and you just bought some diapers, okay, you've got a baby, right? If you've been on these apps for a couple of weeks, it knows thousands of things like this about you. If you've been on this app for year, these apps for years, it knows hundreds of thousands of things about you. And it is learning that stuff 
primarily for one reason. It's learning it to figure out what will keep you scrolling. What can we feed you next that will keep you scrolling? For a super simple reason. Every time you open the app and begin to scroll, they begin to make money. Every time you close the app, that revenue stream disappears. Every time your kids open the app and begin to scroll, they begin to make money because you see ads. Every time they, your kid closes the app, that revenue stream disappears. So all of this genius in Silicon Valley, all of this AI, all of these algorithms is geared towards one thing and one thing only, figuring out how do we get you to open the app as often as possible and scroll as long as possible. That's why they're harvesting all this information about you. Um, and that has all sorts of bad effects on our attention. The average American child uses TikTok for 100 minutes a day. Um, it's very good at hacking our attention, but it leads to an even worse effect. And I think it's one of the key drivers of the division that you're talking about. So these algorithms are set up just to figure out what keeps people scrolling. And, the, and this wasn't the intention of anyone at TikTok or Facebook, but the algorithms uncovered a psychological truth that's actually been known about for quite a long time. The fancy term for it is negativity bias. Basically, all of us will stare longer at things that make us angry and upset than we will at things that make us feel good. If you've ever seen a car crash on the highway, you know what I mean, right? You stared longer at the mangled car wreck than you did at the pretty flowers on the other side of the street. I'd like to think you find what I'm saying interesting, but if someone out there started to have a fight, you would all turn and watch the fight, right? This is very deep in human nature. Ten-week-old babies stare longer at angry faces than happy faces. It's probably for a reason deep in our evolution. Our ancestors who weren't looking out for the angry people got eaten, right? I mean, that's a little bit crude, but you know what I mean. They didn't get to be our ancestors, right? That's always been a little part of human nature. But when it combines with a machinery designed to keep you scrolling that learns very intimately what uniquely angers you, it leads to a terrible effect. So imagine two teenage girls who go to the same party and leave to go home on the same bus. And one of them opens TikTok and goes, that was such a great party, we danced all night, I had such fun, I loved it. And the other girl opens TikTok and says, Karen was an absolute skank at that party and her boyfriend's an asshole and just does an angry long denunciation of everyone at the party. The algorithms are always scanning for the kind of words you use, and it'll put the first video into a few people's feeds. It will put the second video into far more people's feeds. Because if it's enraging, it's engaging. You can imagine, what do you mean Karen's a skank? You're a skank. You'll start having a fight. You'll go back. Has she replied to my angry rebuttal of her, right? You can see how that works. Now, that is bad enough at the level of two teenage girls on a bus. We all know what's happened to the anxiety levels of teenage girls. But now imagine that happening to a whole society where the nice people, the generous people, the compassionate people, the people who say, you know, we're not so different, let's compromise, are muffled and pushed to the back, and the angry, mean, hostile people are given a megaphone. Except you don't have to imagine it, because we've all been living it, right? We've been living it for years. When countries as different as Britain, Brazil, and Burma are all dividing in the same way and hating each other, that tells you there's an underlying mechanism going on, right? So we are being artificially divided. I don't disrespect that there are real things we disagree on, and that's good. That's how it should be in a democracy. We shouldn't all agree. But this rage-filled, bitter, brutal division is being hugely artificially amplified by the social media companies. Um, and we can stop them doing that, right? We can regulate them to stop that mechanism. I can talk about how, but ask me that if you want to know, because I'm conscious this is a long answer. So yeah, it's know that that division is artificial, that actually we all have far more in common than what divides us as human beings, um, and, and, and don't let that artificial rage poison you. Yeah. The one thing I'm happy about artificial division is I've written the only book that was ever praised by both Hillary Clinton and Tucker Carlson. So I feel like this is my like soul. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm very happy about that. The, uh, anyone else want to ask a question? Uh, oh, that's a very timorous audience. It's unusual. Oh, there we go. Oh, yes. I'll, I'll ask, answer that in a minute. I'll just take... Oh, yeah. In fact, should I do that first, if you don't mind? The, yeah, really important question. So... It comes back to that question about, uh, so how do we deal with that specific mechanism? It comes back to uh, 
right what we were saying at the beginning. The profit, right? At the moment, every time you open the app and begin to scroll, they make money. The longer you scroll, the more money they make, right? So people in Silicon Valley kept explaining the solution to this to me, and it seemed so obvious that I, couldn't, I actually couldn't process it properly for a long time. So there are essentially three ways we can finance social media. I'm in favor of social media, right? That, that mechanism I'm describing is not inherent to social media. It only comes from one of the three ways we can fund it. So there are three ways you can fund social media. The first is what we have at the moment. The kind of fancy term for it is surveillance capitalism. It's where you seem to get the product for free. Doesn't cost you anything. But you pay with your attention. You pay with all this anger. So you don't pay anything up front, but you pay with your attention being harvested, your privacy being taken from you, and our politics becoming untenable. So that's one model, the one we have at the moment. But there are two other models that could finance social media, and almost everyone in this room will have an experience of them. Um, so one of them is, um, think about, one of them is subscription. Think about Netflix. Everyone knows how Netflix works. You pay a small amount, in return you get access. We could do that with social media. The key thing is when you do that, all the incentives change. At the moment, you are not the customer of TikTok or Facebook or Twitter. You are the product they sell to the real customer, right? Facebook and TikTok have customer service departments. We can't phone them, right? They won't take our calls because we're not the customer. The advertiser is the customer. We are the product. Our attention is the product they sell to the real customer. If we move to subscription, suddenly, you are the customer, right? So under the current model, they're not asking, what do you want? They're asking, how do we hack and invade you in order to sell your attention for as long as possible to our real customer? But under subscription, suddenly you are the customer. Suddenly they have to go, what do you want? Turns out you feel good when you meet up with people offline, face to face, instead of doom scrolling. Okay, let's design our app to encourage people to meet offline. There's all sorts of things they could do. That, turns out people feel good when they can pay attention. Let's design it to help heal attention, not hack it. We can do that. The technology exists to do it tomorrow, but the incentives have to be there. So that's one alternative. So there's surveillance capitalism, there's subscription. Or think about another example, which literally everyone here has experience of and will have saved the lives of many people in this room. Um, before we had sewers, we had feces in the street and people got all sorts of diseases like cholera. So we all pay to build and maintain the sewers together. You guys own the sewers in this city. I own the sewers in London with everyone else who lives in London, right? Now, it might be that, like, we want to own the sewage pipes together because we don't want to get cholera. We might want to own the information pipes together because we don't want to get the equivalent of cholera for our attention, for our politics. So maybe we want to own it in common. Now, you'd want to make sure that was independent of government. Obviously, we don't want social media controlled by the government. Um, but a good model is the BBC, right? The BBC is funded by British taxpayers. It is independent of the government. It's not part of the government. It doesn't work for them. And it's the most trusted media source in the whole world, right? It's not perfect, but it's pretty good. Um, so we could force social media to move from surveillance capitalism to either subscription or public ownership. Now, the key thing is they won't do that on their own, right? They'll never do that on their own. But there's a really good example of how we get them to do that that a lot of people here, most people here will remember. So when I was a kid, the only form of gasoline you could buy in this country was leaded gasoline, right? In fact, all over the world, that was the, by far the dominant form of gasoline. And, and it was discovered that exposure to lead is really bad for people's brains. It's particularly bad for children's ability to focus. And if it's in the gasoline, it was in the air, everyone was breathing in huge amounts of lead, right? Actually, when they first introduced leaded gasoline in 1925, there was a woman called Dr. Alice Hamilton who warned that this would cause a complete disaster and said there's another form of gasoline we could use. But she was kind of mansplained out the room and they just launched leaded gasoline. And, but we should just remember there was a woman who warned us about this right at the start. Um, by the time you got to the late 70s, early 80s, it was just clear this was causing all sorts of terrible problems. People had unprecedented levels of lead in their bodies. So a group of ordinary moms, who at the time called themselves housewives, banded together and said, this is nuts. Why are we allowing this? Why are we allowing these for-profit companies to screw up our kids' brains? And it's important to notice what those moms didn't say. 
They didn't say, so let's ban gasoline, let's get rid of cars, right? Just like none of us are saying, let's get rid of tech. They said, let's get rid of the specific form of gasoline that's harming us and move to a different form of gasoline that won't harm us. As a result, um, they began to fight, and it followed the classic pattern of all successful political movements that Mahatma Gandhi described. First they ignored them, then they laughed at them, then they fought them, then they won. Everyone knows there's no more lead of gasoline almost anywhere in the world now. Uh, the last country is Venezuela, and they're about to get rid of it. Um, as a result, the Center for Disease Control has calculated the average American child is five IQ points higher than they would have been had we not got rid of leaded gasoline, right? Now, to me, that's a really great example of what we need to do now. Why are we allowing these companies to screw up our kids' brains? Why are we allowing them to screw us up when there's a better alternative? That, and everyone is better off. I mean, li almost literally everyone except Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg would be better off. And even they'd be better off because they'd have a bit less money, but at least they would know they weren't screwing up, screwing up the world, right? Um, so... Yeah, I, I think we, the lead, they'll never do it themselves, right? Just like the lead industry was never going to go, guys, guys, we've made enough money. Let's stop poisoning kids' brains so it's not how it works. They have to be made to do it. We can make them do it. But if we don't, they'll get better and better at screwing with our brains. We all know about the developments that are happening in artificial intelligence. So we have to do this, I would argue, pretty, pretty urgently for the sake of our democracy, for the sake of our children. Um, Shree, <laughs> thanks. Hello. Thank you for being here. Oh, thank you. Um, I loved your dog shit alley story. And I'm just wondering if you have any suggestions or resources on how, um, how we can kind of move the needle for the approach to therapy that we see in our own communities. So it's looking, it takes a more whole person approach and starts to build those connections you talk about. Yeah, it's a really important question. So um, one of the challenges is, so if you read any psychiatry textbook, the ones that will be taught here in the programs here, in theory, all American psychiatry works on, the fancy term for it is the biopsychosocial model. It's very simple. Basically means any mental health problem has three kinds of cause. There are biological causes, like say your genes, changes in your brain. There are psychological causes, like Charter trauma would be one. And there are social causes like loneliness, financial insecurity, right? And for different conditions and for different people, all of them play out to some degree, right? So in theory, we have a biopsychosocial model. In practice, as um, a guy called Professor Lawrence Kiermaier put it to me, in practice, we have a bio, bio, bio model, right? All we talk about is the biology. I'll bet I'd be surprised if there's anyone here who went to their doctor with a mental health problem who got talked about, who got to talk about anything other than the biology of it, right? Um, and it's not that that's not true. Obviously, there are huge biological contributions to mental health problems. Obviously, drugs give some relief to some people. But it's such a narrow vision. And even their own textbooks tell them it's a narrow vision, right? So I think there's a, um, partly it's about widening the picture, right? I, don't, I want to widen the menu of options. I don't want to take anything off the menu, but I want to radically widen the menu of options, right? So partly it's about saying, well, to people in psychiatry and so on, you need to follow your own model, and we need to build something based on a model. But the truth is, lots of, most psychiatrists are good people, and they know that. They need to be given better tools. One person said to me, you know that social prescribing program, the gardening program in East London? The truth is... There is a $10 billion a year industry to tell Lisa, the woman who I talked about, that her depression is just a problem with her brain. And there is a $0 billion industry in telling her you might want to go gardening with a group of people and that will probably help you more. So I think there's a deep answer to your question, which is we need to philosophically transform how we think about pain. Pain and distress are not malfunctions. They are signals and we need to respect and honor them as signals. Then I think there's a very practical and political answer, which is a for-profit medical system will struggle to provide anything that doesn't make someone profit, right? I and mean, when we know that with Americans are hugely given way too many drugs and way too many tests by doctors, right? 
It's staggering. As a British person who lives here half the year, I'm, every time I go to the doctor, they offer me like massive amounts of drugs when I have like a minor, which never happens in Britain, which has a different, you know, as you know, a socialized healthcare system, um, not a private one. So I think you also have to, I think it'll be difficult, not impossible, but difficult to deal with it. So I believe in expanding the Medicaid, Medi Medicare to lower and lower ages progressively as we can. Medicare is the most popular institution in this country after the military. Um, so the more you can expand Medicare, the more I think you can get people to, you can get the system to think more deeply about these issues. But I think we obviously have to fight, that, that's a long fight, so we, we can't just wait for that. So I think we have to try to fight for it as much as possible. I mean, it's worth bearing in mind, most of the solutions are almost free. You know, you think about, social prescribing, it costs nothing to get people to go gardening. You think about that program about changing people's values, that costs literally nothing, right? So you can, and to some degree we have models for that, 12 steps programs, everyone knows they're free. They are the prime, the first step for people with addiction for most people in this country. So we do have a kind of model to build on. But yeah, I think it's, I think it requires a lot of deep changes. And we just have to be honest about it. And I think the last thing I would say about that is, the best way to persuade people of it is to say, how well is the model we're trying now working for us? Right? Are we, are we better off now than we were 40 years ago? Uh, uh, with the, you know, uh, a third of Americans are taking a psychiatric drug. Are we less depressed? Are we less anxious? You know, how well is our, when all the smoke alarms are going off, that's terrible. It means there's a big fire, but it also means you can't really deny we've got to do something about the fire. Um, should we take another? Uh, question? Uh, sooner or later, a hook is going to come. In. I have a question. Hello. Oh, hi. hi. Hi there. Thanks for coming, and thank you for all the good information. I really Thanks. appreciate it. Do you mind um, just holding it? Because my ears have not popped since I landed, so thank you. <laughs> hello, hello. Oh, that's it. Thank you so much. Can you hear me now? Perfect, yes. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you for coming and for all the good information. I do have a question um, in talking about the biology and the psychology and childhood trauma and all of these things. Can you speak to um, the role of spirituality in making connections with people, being healthy in our mind and our, you know, and how that might, you know, affect humanity in general. <laughs> Can you explain how spirituality affects humanity? Is it, uh, <laughs> it reminds me, I was once on the BBC where I was in a debate about whether God exists and it was me and another person. They said, you've got three minutes. So I was like, yeah, we're not going to resolve this one. Uh, but yeah, spirituality, it's a really important question. Um, and I think, um, we used to have institutions of spirituality that have all sorts of flaws, to be sure, but there were places of meaning and community that are separate to just work and making money. And there's been a huge decline, as we know, there's been a huge decline in that, right, across the board. And I think that's part of the problem here, irrespective of what you think about the specific ideas in those religious institutions. Um, but I think there's a, a, a really interesting um, thing that can help us to understand I think the core of what you're asking about, which is, um, so as a lot of you know, there's been this huge re re reawakening in the science of psychedelics. So you had until the 60s, obviously mainly LSD, you had a lot of scientific research and then Nixon shut it all down and in the last seven or eight years, there's been a huge reawakening of that. And most people, when they take psilocybin, which is the active component in magic mushrooms, have a spiritual experience, right? They believe they see God or they see the most profound sources of meaning in the universe. They, believe, they feel profoundly connected. And what we know is when you give, for example, uh, I was talking to someone who's here earlier about this, um, when you give severely depressed people psilocybin, um, they tend to have a really profound reduction in their, in their depression and anxiety for a while. So spirituality, a sp intense spiritual experience. If you think about one, one of the things that depression and anxiety are, is being trapped in your own head and your own ego and, and being disconnected from everything but that. And what, what psilocybin does is it just switches off the part of the brain that thinks egotistically. You cannot think egotistically. It's why often you'll hit yourself in the face when you're on psilocybin because you, you've actually forgotten what the boundaries of your own body are, never mind your ego, right? Um, uh, so I think that, now there'll be many people who don't want to take psychedelics, and psychedelics are not the solution by any means, but I think that shows 
if an intense spiritual experience through psychedelics helps reduce depression, anxiety, and addiction by reducing ego states and increasing connection, well, that should help us to understand that other forms of spirituality, defined very broadly, for some people it'll be God, for some people it'll be Buddhism, you know, different things for different people. Um, I think that shows us, and there's lots of other evidence for this as well, spiritual experiences reduce depression and anxiety. Feelings of awe, you know, it's one of the reasons why nature reduces depression, exposure to the natural world. Most people in a really beautiful natural landscape, I talked to someone before about Death Valley, I went to Death Valley recently for the first time, and you just stand there and you're just in this sense of awe, where you, you feel small and you get a sense the world is big and beautiful and amazing. So feelings of awe, feelings of transcendence, feelings of meaning and beauty, which tend to be what people get in spiritual experiences as well, profoundly reduce depression and anxiety. You compare that to how you feel with desperately craving the next heart on Instagram or, you know, how you feel when you buy a pair of shoes, right? It does, it's not as, that's not as good. Uh, yes, I think that's the core answer. Hello. Oh, the last question. Hello. Hi. Um, so I guess... For people who are chronically online, um, they could say that they feel connection or they feel security online, on social media and stuff like that. But do you believe that they actually do feel connected online or do you think that's like the hook or the drug of social media thinking that they feel connected? It's a really good question. So I spent a lot of time at the world's first ever internet rehab center. It's in Spokane in Washington state. Um, and I remember when I went, <laughs> it's a kind of clearing in the woods. And when I arrived, totally instinctively, I stepped out of the car. I glanced at my phone and felt really pissed off I didn't have any cell phone signal. And I was like, oh, yeah, you're in the right place. Um, so um, I, I went in, and um, it's fascinating, this place. It's run by an amazing woman called Dr. Hilary Cash, who you guys should invite. She's such a wise person. And um, they get all kinds of people in this rehab center, but they disproportionately get young men who become obsessed with either multiplayer online games. At that time, it was um, World of Warcraft, but it'd be Fortnite now. And, or pornography, right? Absolutely obsessed with pornography. Um, I spent a lot of time speaking to these young men who were very intelligent and thoughtful. Um, and when, when I left, me and Hillary went for dinner. And she said to me, you've got to ask yourself, what are these young men getting out of these games? You know, every addiction is an attempt to solve a problem, right? They're getting something out of these games. And she said, in many ways, what they're getting out of the game is things they used to get from the culture but no longer get, right? They're getting a sense that they're physically moving around. I think the figures for young people not leaving the house are just staggering, right? Only 3% of American children play outside without an adult. So they're getting a feeling they're physically exploring the environment. Um, they're getting a sense that people see them. At least someone's watching you play the multiplayer game, right? Um, they're getting a sense they're good at something. We have a school system that particularly makes boys feel they're not good at anything. A really bad school system that gets them to learn meaningless garbage for pointless tests that measure nothing of any value and make boys feel dumb and incompetent. Um, uh, but what they're getting is a bit like a kind of hologram of those things, right? I don't think it's a coincidence they're obsessed with porn, right? You know, I'm not anti-porn, but anyone here, if your sex life consisted of looking at nothing but pornography, you'd be going around kind of pissed off all the time because we didn't evolve to look at pornography, we evolved to have sex, right? And in the same way, I'm not, of course I'm not against screens, but a, a life that is mostly lived through screens does not meet your needs to be seen. There is a reason why I bet no one in this room in the last two years ever heard anyone say the sentence, hooray, another Zoom call, right? No one, right? If screen-based interaction met our deepest needs as human beings, we would have all been completely fine the last two years because we've all spent two years on screens and we didn't feel fine. We felt unseen and unheard and cut off from the things that matter. So. Um, John Cassiopo, the loneliness expert that I mentioned, gave a great um, way of thinking about social media to me. He said, if it's a way station to seeing people offline, if it's a way of staying in touch with people who you're in contact with offline, if it's primarily that, it's a good thing. 
If it's the last stop on the line, if it's the main place you're going, something's gone wrong, right? So absolutely people get a sense of connection and meaning from social media, and that's a good thing, right? And we can redesign social media so that it maximizes that. Think about, um, you know, like you were saying before, I'm gay, right? Think about how much easier it is for gay kids to find each other now than it was 15 years ago. That's a good thing. There are all sorts of forms of connection that are facilitated in a positive way. Um, but it should be in balance. I'm not against, you know, the delicious um, sugary food that was out there that I ate three of. But if that's your whole diet, you're going to have problems, right? So I think we want it to be part. We want it to be designed in the best possible way. Um, we don't want to devalue or say to people who do find connection there that that's not meaningful to them, especially if we're not offering a better environment, right? For those young men in, those, in that rehab center, it was that environment or nothing, right? Well, okay, if you've got that or nothing, that's why we've got to expand the menu. Uh, yeah, that's the core mindset. I'll just say one last thing. I think, uh, I'm, I, think I meant to sign some books or something, but I, uh, um, so I'll stick around if anyone wants to talk to me. But um, I had this really weird experience I get very subconscious about when people ask me to sign their books, which is the first time I ever got asked to sign a book. It was in Baltimore. It was in a, the launch of my first book. Like the third woman in the line came up to me and said, will you write something, will you write a message for someone? I said, sure, what do you want me to say? She said, will you write... Dear Peter, it's over, I never loved you anyway. <laughs> and I was like, no, you tell Peter, she got really angry. So I'm very happy to ask, ask any other questions you do want to ask in front of everyone. I will sign your books, but I will not dump your boyfriend for you. Thanks very much, everyone. Cheers. Yeah.